And the very first one I ever made was when Sierra Noble came up here to do a concert and uh, she wanted to come out and see my workshop. So on the way out here, she asked me if I could make a five string fiddle. And I said, yeah, I, I, I haven't made one, but I can make anything you like. And she said, I'd love a five string fiddle. And I said, don't worry about it, sweetheart. I'll make you a five string fiddle and it won't cost you a thing. <laughs> so I did and I couldn't go back on my promise. <laughs> So we designed this instrument out there in the workshop and believe it or not, these five string fiddles, and I'm sure it's partly to do with the wood that I use, it's all from one big old white spruce tree that, that uh, came down just about a hundred yards from the cabin here. And every instrument I've made from that tree has just had a beautiful sound. It was a good tree. Yeah, it's my <laughs> magic fiddle tree. Yeah. You'll see, so you see... Uh, the inlay of that black and white inlay that goes all the way around the fiddle. So that's what I'm doing right now. That one belongs on here and I took it off because I wasn't happy with it and I'm reconstituting it to do some modifications on oh, it. Okay. Oh really? It, it was such a beautiful sounding instrument and I yeah. thought well it's a pity I don't make it look better. Oh. So that's what I've, Alistair, I'm doing. Oh you have the confidence to do that. Oh my god. Wow. Yeah. So that's what the inside of a fiddle actually looks like, a finished fiddle. This one, this, this is just an absolutely beautiful sounding instrument. And uh, it's already been singing its heart out over to Mark and Crystal. Mark, <laughs> Mark gave this thing about a 40 minute workout there the other night, just on Sunday. In fact, he's done that twice with this fiddle. So. And tell them about the laburnum, because that's such an interesting story. Okay, so this, these fingerboards, Again, I'm probably the only guy in the world that uses laburnum for my fingerboards. Number one, it's just a whole lot more beautiful than ebony. Ebony, look, it's just jet black. Yeah. It looks like it'd be a hunk of plastic. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so how that came about was, I was over visiting my friend Keith Mackey, he's a farmer in Scotland who has a workshop as well. And uh, I was complaining, oh, I was going to have to, spring for some new ebony to make fingerboards with and it, um, a piece that big is, is about for a decent piece of ebony is like sixty dollars mm -hmm. so he says have you ever tried laburnum and I said no I've never really heard of it well he says I've got some out in the shop maybe you should, you should try that he said it, it has been used in the past as a substitute for ebony and it's actually harder than ebony it's more stable than ebony and it's lighter than ebony so it's got three things that are better <laughs> it's than a ebony. So I said, okay, I'll try it. And every single one of the fiddles I've ever made, I've got the laburnum fingerboard. And that's what it looks like. And, and I like how you let the grain show through it. The yeah. The first time we were, even with the laburnum, I think you were, you were seeing that's it right. black. That's right. But uh, just so uh, unique. Uh, well, that was from Ian Kinnear, the pipe maker. Right. Ian told me the secret. So you fumigate, once you've got it all carved out, exactly how you want it, you fumigate it in ammonia, like you don't dip it right in the ammonia, you just put it in a, a, a I, I use a basin, and it, set it on a stand in a, a little bowl that's got ammonia in it, uh -huh. and after about three or four days, it just darkens down to that beautiful rich color. Beautiful. Yeah. And um, here's what it looks like if you don't fumigate it. Yeah, there's a piece there. Oh, wow. So you can see how it just turns it into a beautiful, rich color like that. Yeah. I love it. Oh, yeah. So beautiful. I wonder who thought of that. Uh, <laughs> I think that trick has probably been known for several hundred years. Um, I wouldn't doubt that at all. Ian's a pipe maker. and um, He was here for Culture Days, Ian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he um, lives in the same village that I grew up in. And he just made two whole brand new sets of pipes out of laburnum. 
And I think that was largely instigated by me when I was showing him the <laughs> laburnum fingerboards. But he did say, he's got an old, old 200 year old set of pipes that were made of laburnum up in Glen Esk. So he did know, he knows before the British had access to the fancy woods that they did during their, their empire days, uh, like um, ebony and all kinds of fancy woods. They still had laburnum. And um, that's what they used because it's Makes got sense. so many of the great qualities, you know. So he's actually made brand new ones out of laburnum. Wow. They sound absolutely awesome. Remember I showed yeah. them to you, Christine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm doing here now. I'm just digging the... I'm digging out the um, little channel to inlay that stuff, and I'll show you the actual stuff that I use for anyway. Because it looks like it's just a sharpie, <laughs> or something. It's just amazing how it <coughs> pieces inside. So, as you can well imagine, I'll show you the tools I use for that. Yeah, I should have had these dug out. Yeah, that's one. That's one. So, you've got to keep the edge of that channel, you've got to keep it absolutely vertical. Because if not, you're going to end up with gaps and it's going to look like a botched job. So, for that reason, you'll notice you use a knife that's only sharpened on one side. So that you can cut in here like this and it will be a vertical cut and it's not going to want to wander off on you. Mm -hmm. and then once you've done that, you use these little chisels here to, to dig it out. So, I've gone one round all the way, and that took me, probably took me four or five hours just to do that carefully, and I'll have to do that at least three times before it gets deep enough. So just, just to do that one job is, is a minimum of 12 hours. Wow. And so each, each pass you go a little bit deeper? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just go just a little bit deeper. And if you try to get, I mean, I know really, really uh, expert, experienced violin makers probably do a lot quicker than I do. But uh, I've got to be really careful because if you try and, if you get in a rush or you're getting fed up and you get in a hurry, uh, what will tend to happen is, especially on the end grain bits like this, it'll chip whole pieces out of there because you get them. So, I mean, you can glue them back in so nobody will ever notice. Mm -hmm. But you try to avoid that at all, if at all possible. Yeah. So, that's what it'll end up looking like. And then we'll show you back again when we go in. Oh yeah, well you can see it here. You do that back and front. Mm -hmm. You do it on the back as well. So 24 hours total, yeah. <laughs> front and back. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, it takes me, that's about right, because it takes me two days to do the purfling. Wow, yeah. It takes me two days to do it. And I'll sort of explain about the, the chiseling, the, the shaping of the inside of the, of the, um, well, of the um, that's so, so too. just happened, so, ha okay, well, that's exactly, I mean, it, look, it seems kind of strange that you would be doing all this decorative work when it's still at such an early stage in making this. That's how it tells you to do it in the book. And if you think after 500 years of making fiddles, you suddenly come up with a better idea. You did not come up with a better idea. Because about five steps further on, that's when you find out you have to do this. Yeah. Now. There's a reason for it all. There's right? a, absolutely a reason for it all. And I follow that book to the T. And sometimes when I... I, I suddenly think I know what I'm doing. Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so to shape that like this, you 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 just uh, use this gouge. And you just chisel away like this. And you have to have a really good eye for symmetry. And it's all done by eye. 
I don't use, I have never used, I mean a lot of guys they use templates to check the shape and all that and uh, you know they put it on here and then they keep chiseling away and but I just go do it completely by eye. I've, I did have, I've got all the templates, I just never use them. So you're gonna look down there like that and if you see anything that does not look symmetrical then you correct it. You see if you look down there you can see how it looks pretty well, it symmetrical. Looks pretty good to me. <laughs> it's the same thing with the F holes. They're very critical. You have to have them almost exact mirror image. Because if one is even slightly different than the other, or if it's a slightly different angle, or it's not exactly the same shape and everything else, um, it looks like a botched job. Mm -hmm. the, the human eye picks up that very quickly. And yeah. you just look at it and just Makes you cockeyed looking at it. You were telling me that it was this, some of the old, like Guaneri's or whatever. Yeah. That they were just kind of. Yeah. I think there's a picture, <laughs> or maybe not in this book. But it doesn't really affect the sound, but it just. No, uh, not at all. Oh, but I'll show you something. Mm -hmm. So there's a fiddle in here. It's the most valuable fiddle in the world. It's called the Messiah, and it's a Stradivarius. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that, you can see. I picked it up right away, and then I read about it years later. I just looked at that, and I could tell, well, that's the most, that is priceless. That's hanging in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford in England. And that instrument is absolutely priceless. It's supposed to be the most perfect Stradivarius violin ever made. Nobody would even take a guess uh, what it's worth, but... A, about the only Stradivarius viola that will ever come on the open market because they're all locked away in institutions and everything else. There's only 12 of them in the world. Came up for auction uh, last year or the year before with a starting bid of 45 million dollars. So, and if we've got time I can show you the video of the guy demonstrating it. It's just a fabulous instrument. Wow. But, I don't know if you can see it. But can you see there's anything wrong with that scroll? This way. Yeah, it's not symmetrical. See, oh, this, yeah. these, these volutes are lower than that. Well, you just can't, you just wouldn't get away with that nowadays. Mm -hmm. because <laughs> the level of, you know, perfection that you have to achieve nowadays is so great that hey, you just can't get away with that now. And if you look at mine, you see it's absolutely perfectly symmetrical. Yeah. Every, every way you look at it. You look at it at the back, yeah. the side, and the end. Yeah. And it has to look symmetrical well, for The me. next one, Alistair, just make it asymmetrical and we'll sell it for $46 million yeah. Yeah. for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so that's, that's the, messiah. the Messiah. And you can see it looks just like it just came off the work, workman's bench. It was made in 1716. It's hardly been played, and it, everything else about that fiddle. Oh, that's beautiful. The workmanship is is, is perfect. The beautiful uh, way he's done the purfling. Talk about this book a little bit too, Alistair. Okay, well, that's a little bit of a story mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it was during, um, I think it was when Titanic was on, something like that. We were all up in the lounge. Um, having a drink, and I said to Crystal, well, I've made up my mind, I'm going to make a fiddle, and I've, I've watched everything on YouTube about it, and the, the longest one I had watched was an old Scottish guy, kind of like myself, and he goes into all the details, and it's up an hour long, it's quite detailed, and then he looks at the camera at the end, and he says, look, you're never getting to make a fiddle watching YouTube, it's impossible. <laughs> he says, the definitive book on fiddles is the art of violin making by... Chris Johnson and Roy Cortnell. So I immediately ordered or got Lois to order it for me. And lo and behold, it was back ordered. But I was sitting across the table from Crystal and she's, oh, I just bought Mark a book about fiddle making. And I said, wouldn't happen to be the art file in making by Chris Johnson and Roy Cortnell, would it? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> so I, the first fiddle I ever made, I used uh, Mark's book. <laughs> nice. And this thing, that, so, to make a this is by far the best instructional book 
of how to do anything I've ever ever had. It, it just, you're, you're just never going to make a fiddle if you, and without this book. <laughs> you can try, but it's not going to happen. You're just not going to be able to. But the, the level of detail oh, wow. on how to do everything in here. And lots of photos too, which is nice. Tons and tons of pictures, great explanations, and the reason why you do things when you do them. Yeah. And uh, not like coming along and thinking, well, I think I've got a better idea than that. I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> well, and just even like some of the tools that you made, the knives you made yeah. specifically for this job. Yeah. Is I made a lot of my own tools. Everything in this box here, all of these tools, all of that stuff, I did not make that. But all these specialty tools I made myself, even those little chisels. There's a whole an array of chisels here, for, and you can see each one has a very, very specific purpose. And how I came about that was um, I'd come to a job that I had to do, and I would think to myself, well, I can make a better tool to do that job. Yeah. So I would down tools right away, and I'd make a tool. And these are all made out of... Um, what they call tool steel, and it's what they make normal chisels now. Except this is it's called the drill rod, and it just makes beautiful tools. It takes a fantastic edge, and and these knives, all of these knives, they're made out of hacksaw blades. <laughs> wow! So I made all of these too. And how do you like? How did you shape them? Just I just shape them the same way. That, oh, you mean the, the, the steel? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 well, I use the grinder there yeah. behind you. Um, and files. Mostly the, I make them on the grinder. Wow. And then polish up the steel after and everything else. And, yeah. So that's just about as much fun as actually making fiddles as yeah. making the tool. <laughs> so all these planes here, every one of these came from eBay. And they ranged in price. They were all pre-World War uh, II Stanley Bailey planes. That's when they really made beautiful, beautiful tools. And I believe it or not, I use every one of those at some stage or other. And uh, they were all kind of basket cases. They were totally wrapped with broken handles, broken knobs. Uh, the blades in them were all pitted and everything else. So. I would take a whole day and I would strip them right down the time I was finished with them, they were like they just came out of the factory. And they're, they're just beautiful tools to use. You cut wood with that, you know, to plane something on the, the plane there. It's just like cutting butter. It's just so nice to use. So that's them. I would say I ranged from about forty to about seventy dollars. That's a few years ago, and I, I, I look for them now. There's, you still can pick tools like that up. You can't get anything under about close to two hundred dollars now. Yeah. On on eBay, yeah. all these came up from eBay, and they're all the different sizes. Now there is a. I'm not sure. This is a number three, I think. Yeah. It goes down to a two which is an even smaller plane, and they're so rare that they're a thousand, you know, they're a thousand dollars. Well, I was never going to be putting out a thousand dollars for an old plane. Yeah. But they're so rare, because hardly anybody ever bought those right. number two. Yeah. People would buy this instead. And a number two is not that much bigger than that, but I'd love to actually have one, wow. even posing. That one's cute. Yeah, I use this more. I use this one actually more than just all the other ones. Wow. Yeah, because I'm, I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm doing a lot of fine work. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Those are, they're beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous. And they're beautiful to use. Okay, so I'll show you some specialty tools here that only fiddle makers would ever use. Well, one in your hand looks like a dentist could use it. Oh, when I, the, when I go to the dentist, I'm just drooling. <laughs> well, we all are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the tools that they have reasons. there, 
I, I used to say to Dr. Ashraf all the time, well, have you ever disposed of any of these things? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'd use it for, but it looked like I could use it for something. <laughs> so if you come over here, I'll show you all these specialty tools. So what this is for is if your fiddle, let's say, has a crack in it down here. So you can put that on. Let's say the crack is, well, like that. So you put that there. You tighten up these two things. Like that. And then you tighten that. And that forces that together and keeps it perfectly aligned. Clever. Yeah. And these are hard to find. They're very hard to, they're difficult to find. I mean, there are specialty shops where you can buy them, but it took me quite a while to come across one of these. And I've used it quite a bit. So to make your peg holes, handy having this fiddle here. At a very early stage, uh, before you carve any of this, you drill the holes. I drill it on that uh, drill press there. You drill the holes through. And then once you've done all the carving and you get it, and you drill the holes smaller, and that's how and that's how you ream it out. And you've got to do that's another thing you've got to do really carefully. You just do one turn at a time when you get close to the end. And these are uh, these uh, machine head pegs; they're just absolutely just beautiful. Beautiful, I'm jealous of them. And um, so you can see you try and get them so that you've got the same just aesthetically. It looks nice to have, but the same length. Mm -hmm. out from the thing for each one. <laughs> and that's a pretty fine cut to get that. And then you, these actually just, the splines on these things, you just push them in and you have to get it just about perfect. And once the splines lock into the hole, that's it. And this one worked out first time perfectly. I mean, it's not the end of the world if it goes in too deep because I've got secret ways of <laughs> Fixing that. Tricks of the trade. Yeah. <laughs> Tricks of the trade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Okay, so um, inside, okay, I don't have a finished fiddle here, but inside a fiddle, there's a thing called a sound post. And it's just, I'll show you one. There's one in here somewhere. I'm trying to move up a little bit more, more Jacob. So that goes on this side of the fiddle, but you can only put it in once the fiddle has been completed. And you go through the F holes. Well, I can show you exactly how it happens. So you stick it on here like this. I won't get, I won't get too fussy here. And then you uh, stick it in there like that, turn it around, and you get it exactly where you want it, and you just, <gasps> it's okay. I know it's scary sometimes. Oh. And then, it's not going to work because this is not glued in, but then you just pluck that like that and it'll stick in between the top and the bottom. Without that, a fiddle just sounds absolutely dead. And that's what he was talking about. That's the thing that transfers a vibration from the top to the bottom and amplifies the sound. So that's what that thing's for. This thing here is for figuring out how long you want to make your sound post. So what you do with that is you stick that in there. You get it about where you want the sound post to go, which is always right behind the, the necks. And you just go like this. Lock it in place. And that's how long, that's about how long you want your sound post. You make it slightly longer than that. Where did you find that tool? Where did you get that tool? That is like a, that's a specific tool. The world's tiniest specific. caliper. <laughs> And quite often, well, I can give you a demo of that too. Quite often, you don't get it first time. In fact, sometimes you do, but sometimes it takes a dozen tries to get that 
signpost in the right place. Of course, the, the signpost is now in there, and it's kind of inaccessible. So what you do is this. Oh, there's it gone. And this is tricky to do. A lot of tricky things for me. That's how you get it out. Well done. And that's another secret tool, especially made for that. Okay, I didn't get quite far enough down. <clears throat> so that's how you get some post out. out. Well done. And then you have another try. Yeah. Wow. I love how there's a tool for each little little yeah. step, right? <laughs> there, there's just a tool for everything, and if there isn't one, you think, and then you just make one. Yeah. yeah. So I do how that. many hours does it take you from beginning to end to make a... It takes me... Uh, I'm sure it takes me 300 hours. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it takes me all of that. And the, one of the, okay, uh, so you carve the top first, and you get it exactly, and it has to be a, a, in its finished form. Like, I mean, that's what I'll do here. The purfling will be on, the curvature and everything will be completely on. And then you have to use this tool here to make the wood the exact thickness. And it can't be close. It's got to be right. So, what you do is you use this thing here and you can see it's got a dial on it. Mm -hmm. And you can see that's exactly three millimeters. Oh, yeah. And it'll be three millimeters everywhere. So the, how I do it is I I use these little planes mm -hmm. and I will uh, gradually plane away a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and then check it. And when it gets very close to three millimeters, I mark it with a, cr a little cross on that spot. And then I move to a next, the next spot and I do the same thing again and, until the whole body is exactly three millimeters. Mm -hmm. That takes... Hours and hours and friggin' hours yeah. to do. Have you ever had a temper tantrum? Um, <laughs> I've often gone below the three millimeters uh, inadvertently, usually in and around this area here. But uh, yeah, it's annoying, but I don't get my knickers too much in a twist because <laughs> okay. it's still safe down to okay. about two millimeters. Okay. So it's not the end of the world. Okay. Yeah. So that's how you thickness it and then. So this whole plate is basically three millimeters throughout, and that's very tricky. You've got to have a lot of patience yeah. to do that. <laughs> and I, I, to be honest, not that I want to be bragging about it, but Greg East is the one that pointed out, probably 90% of all people on earth just could not do this. No. Yeah. They just would not have the patience for it. You really have to want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. All this you wood here came and this here, I'll show you that just shortly, all came from one tree just down the path. I think I took Crystal down and showed it to her. It's still there. Uh, but Daniel Gervais and Clint Peltier, Daniel is the two-time Canadian Grandmaster Fiddler of Canada, and I made him a viola, and they wanted to see this tree I was telling them about. So we walked down there, they came out, they came out here and stayed with me for a few days. Those guys are Fabulous musicians. I love that. And I said, you know what? You guys could actually help me here because I'm, I'm just getting too old and uh, I can't do this shit on, on my own anymore. So they helped me cut a hunk of tree about that long and about that big off of that tree. And I brought it back here and cut it all up. So two Canada's top musicians actually helped me to get the actual wood. Although Daniel's um, viola that I made for him was already made by then. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Wow. And so was he the one that he did a special dedication uh, to you? There was a song yeah. that you sent us. Yeah, yeah. Um, for yeah. Alistair, it's a tune. Yeah, we have to put it on the Yeah, party. so <laughs> what happened was he wrote this tune for me on the viola I made for him. And he played it and he sent me the recording of it and I sent it to my family in Scotland. Mm -hmm. My brother Angus says, I can't believe that guy hasn't been here. He said, that music fits the ambience of the countryside around here perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, why didn't I think of that? So I made a video of it. We, we can watch that when we yeah, go. Yeah. Oh, I'd, like to, yeah. I'd like to have that music too, that was Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I love stories. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. So, I'm just like imagining everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you, Alistair, so much. Okay, let's go upstairs. Yep. And I'll show you. Oh, the yeah, right, right. The I have one, one question. Is this what you use like at the very beginning? Is, um, this, is that like, yeah. a, like when you're cutting the wood? In fact, um, um, I'm trying to remember. Yes, it is. Uh, you can see. In fact, you know what? That was there because of some work I was doing that, doing on that. But when I resume work on this plate here, and resume putting the purfling in, I'll be screwing that into there. You can see the two holes oh, for it. Okay, yeah. And this is the board that I'll actually be using for that. Cool. So it's kind of a just a jig I, yeah. I made, and I got the pattern for this out of the book as well. No. <laughs> I'm not sure why it's exactly the way it is, but I wasn't going to argue with it. <laughs> <laughs> so here is my ammonia thing, and I just leave the fingerboard on there, and put a basin over it, and leave it in there for however long it takes me um, to do whatever I'm doing at the time, and I just leave it there. Now you can see I was sorting out all this wood and matching it up to make that fiddle that, that I'm just doing the purfling on right now. Mm, yeah. So I had it all spread out. I, I know it gets in the way, but I, I'll put that all back together and then. So I, I cut these boards from logs like this. And this is the actual tree. You see it's just raw wood. So I take that into McIsaac School and Colin, who's the shop teacher there, he's another Scottish guy, he lets me slice this up on the big the big uh, bandsaw, but since Covid I can't do that, I can't go into the school, so I'm going to search around, probably go on Craigslist or something in the city, see if I can pick up a big bandsaw, so I'm not, come, I'm not depending on anybody else for doing stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so um, Scotland. <laughs> this, this is the laburnum from Scotland and this will all be fingerboards or some of it will be. I don't know if we'll live long enough to use all of it. <laughs> but and the weight of it, I just want uh, yeah. the laburnum was was kind of interesting. Like it has a real a real Ooh, it's yeah. dense. Yeah it's quite dense. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. I love it. It's, yeah. re it's really nice to work with. It doesn't never splinters on you or splits or does any of the other thing. But this wood quite often does. Yeah. You've got to be really careful working that quite spruce. There's a little. So I've got a friend. I forgot to show you that downstairs. But I've got a friend who's one of the top gun makers in Scotland. His name is Mike Lingard, and I've known Mike basically since he was a kid. But he's grown up to be a specialty gun maker. He makes his just fifty thousand dollar sporting shotguns and rifles and stuff. He actually made hunting rifles for Prince Harry and Prince William. His dad commissioned him to make these really, really fancy guns for him. So he ends up with all these cut off bits like this. And he has a whole beautiful He's got a whole box of this stuff, so I go over and visit him like several times when I'm over there every year. Like I said, I've known Mike since he was a kid, so he, 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 it's not like I'm interrupting a special uh, important guy. He is a special important guy, but to me he's just Mike. Yeah. And I'll go in and I'll say, okay Mike, have you got any cut off bits for me? 
Oh, I've got a hail box out there. You better get rid of here before I use it for kindling. <laughs> Says that just about every time. <laughs> so that's what this wood is. Now, wow. That's for the tail pieces and the uh, chin rests. Okay. And I've got them and downstairs. So I can show beautiful. you that. So again, that entirely unique. Nobody else, no fiddle maker on the planet except me has access to this top grade wood. A piece of this wood, uh, which would be about that big, or maybe for a rifle it would be about that big, starts off at £5,000 before Mike has even started working on it. £5,000. Wow. That's almost $7,000 just for the piece of any fiddles. So, okay, so that's the wood department. I don't think there's anything. Oh, yeah. So, again, I can show you this uh, when we go back downstairs. So, part of when you're making a fiddle and you've got the, um, the ribs and everything pretty well finished, you then have to add what they call the linings. So that's another thing that I use the, the wood from a little uh, the willow tree that I cut down the shoreline here. And I make that all out of the willow, the, the linings for all the fiddles. And why do you use willow for that? It so just bends so nicely and it's super, super lightweight, it's strong, it bends, it's perfect. And that wasn't my idea either. I, uh, I, a lot of Stradivariuses and a lot of these old Italian fiddles, that's what they often used was willow. Huh. Uh, so if it was good enough for them, good enough for me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay, Thank so... Thank you, Alistair. We can go back downstairs. Okay, well, in here. Oh, yeah, here we are. Uh, so, this is, that's a viola form. Mm -hmm. If you're making a viola, use that. Uh, and that is just an ordinary sized fiddle. And uh, I think that's viola. And that's the five string. I actually made a new one of this, which I'll show you downstairs. I decided to make a new hardwood one. This one was getting kind of worn out. But all the violas I've made were using this form here. Okay. Now we'll go down and we'll show the you. The five string fiddle, though, you came up with your own form, I guess. Yeah. Because it's really. Um, the five string and, and my ordinary fiddle and the viola, all okay. three. Okay. I did not use anybody's pattern. Okay. I completely designed them all myself, Crystal. Huh. Yeah. I want a countertop made of a wood like this one day. It would be the most expensive, expensive countertop yeah. in the world. Yeah. Uh, no, it's desk. actually a standard yeah. walnut and it comes from Turkey. Okay. Wow. Like a That's fucking beautiful. guitar body made out of that. That would be so awesome. And like stain it some blue or something. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, that's the top, which I'll do, and then I've got to do all the same thing with the back. This is going to be the back of that fiddle. It's going to be really nice once it's polished up. And this this is the form I was just showing you upstairs. And these are the ribs. And there's the linings that I make out of the local willow. And this is going to be the neck and the scroll. <clears throat> so this is going to be a... This fiddle will probably be singing maybe within three months. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Whoa, that's so great. I just want to... I'm just looking at the line. Yeah, that's the willow. So... I put that in there and it helps keep everything nice and firm and strong mm -hmm. and then when uh, to uh, when you finally get around to the, this stage this is glued this is glued in here and you just take the, that's a hammer and you give that a little tap that there and there and there and there and then it comes out here you can see and then I have to do the same thing here put the linings in the top as well the thought of tapping that out just gives me the chills. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you can see the, the lining is in both the top. Oh, and the yeah. And that's what it ends up looking like. Cool. And 
So you can see how these end up getting shaped mm -hmm. and how uh, that is inlaid into the wood yeah. in the corners. It folds it in there. Yeah. yeah. Close your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks kind of scary, but yeah. it, it works every time. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Yeah. So you can see how I try to, although nobody will ever, ever notice this, you'll never see it, how I try to uh, the grains. make the grain of the wood perfectly. So, it's, so, so it's flowing yeah. and almost looks like it's a special pattern. And you can see even on the sides, I was able to match it up really nice on this one. Even on the sides, you can see how that grain just flows from there right into there all the way down. So. Nobody ever notices that, but I do. Yeah. You can see it's the same thing here. But that's the, the special little things that I add to my instruments yeah. that you just don't see anywhere else, or huh. I've never seen it anywhere else. I, I do it because I've got the time to do it. I'm not doing this for a living. Yeah. You know, I'm not rushing to get another one made for mm. a customer. Yeah. I just do it. For Passion. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it, gets, it gives me a reason to get up in the morning. I love doing it. And when you finally finish your fiddle and you pick it up and play it, it's awesome. It's just like magic. Fiddles are kind of magic. It's just incredible the amount of sound that comes out of such a small instrument. Yeah. 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 An amazing design. He's an alchemist. <laughs> That's that fancy wood. Oh, that is. That goes on the back there. So this, these two were on this one when it was still all in one piece. I just wasn't happy with it. And the first time I took it over to Mark and Crystals, and Mark was playing it, he never noticed anything. But when I played it, I pick it up. And the hand, it just didn't feel comfortable in the hand. So I completely, completely reshaped this whole neck. Uh, that's another adjustment. And I do that with all the fiddles. You know, you just never quite get it absolutely right, no matter how much you try the first time. So there's a process of adjustment that I go through, um, and the fiddle itself will change. They're quite moody to begin with, like one morning you'll pick it up and they just sound absolutely amazing. And then you pick it up the next day and it's, oh well, it's okay, but nothing special. Not, they're like that for quite a long time. They're very moody, and but by some fortunate quirk of nature, um, they always seem to improve with time. They never seem to get worse. They always seem to just improve. They like being played.